What a blessed day God has given us. Today, we celebrate God's presence among us for the past 151 years. As the people of Emmanuel, we've known God's love, his peace and joy for generations. And we have the opportunity, by God's grace, to share that love, peace and joy for generations to come. Just imagine the tens of thousands of people God has connected to himself through Emmanuel that will all be gathered together one day in heaven. What a celebration that will be. But why wait for that day to celebrate? Let's do it today. Let's celebrate all that God has done over these past 151 years and all that he will do in the years to come. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church. And we're not done yet. Built on the rock, the church will stand, even when steeples are falling. Crumbled half spires in every land, fell still our chiming and pouring, calling the In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. And so we take a moment for self-examination. Let us confess our sins to God, confident of his grace and forgiveness to all who are penitent. I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. And now the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church today. My name is Laura Gilliland, and I am a preschool teacher here at Emmanuel. Um, I'm excited to be with you today. We are going to be doing something kind of fun today. 
We're going to play a game. Have we ever played a game yet for our children's message? Well, today's the day. So if you're sitting on the couch, I'm going to have you stand on up and come right in front of the TV and we're going to play Simon Says today. Now remember the rules of Simon Says. What happens is if I say Simon Says raise your hand, you raise your hand. But if I don't say the word Simon Says before, you don't do the actions. Let's practice it. This is our practice round. Here we go. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, put your hands on your waist. Simon says, jump up and down. Stop. I didn't say Simon says. <laughs> so we gotta keep jumping. Now let's do it for real. Here we go, here we go. This isn't the practice. All right, here we go. Simon says, touch your shoulders. These are your shoulders. Simon says, wiggle your hips. Simon says, stop. Simon says, touch your nose. Touch your mouth. Did we get you? <laughs> Simon says, touch your mouth. Simon says, touch your hair. Simon says, put your hands together like we're going to pray. Oh, good job. You can leave them there, actually. Let me finish talking to you. Isn't it fun to just play games sometimes? I mean, sometimes when mommy and daddy might say, let's play a game together, you're like, yeah, let's go. Games are fun. Having fun with your friends is fun. You know, sometimes being at church is fun. <laughs> We can have fun with our friends at church in this community of believers. You know, here we are today celebrating 151 years of Emmanuel. And what a fun thing. Let's have fun together. We are the church. And we can build each other up and have fun together as Christ followers. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the fun that you are. Thank you that you love us. We love you back, and we want to give back to you. Lord, be with us this week, and just help us to enjoy being Christians. Amen. Have a good week. So, here's a question for you. How long have you lived? Tony Campolo, one of my favorite authors, was teaching a course at the University of Pennsylvania when he picked a student on the front row and said, Young man, how long have you lived? He said, what do you mean? And Campolo said, well, how long have you lived? And the student said, 23 years. The professor said, no, 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 that's how long your heart has been pumping blood. That's not how long you have lived. He then proceeded to tell the class about the time he went to the top of the Empire State Building in New York City. He was nine years old at the time, and as he ran around at the top of the building, he suddenly caught himself and said, Tony, you're on top of the Empire State Building. You are on top of the world. In one mystical, magical moment, he looked out at the horizon and took in the entire city. He lived that moment with such intensity and focused on what was before him with such spiritual energy that if he lived a million years, that moment would still be a part of his consciousness because he was fully alive when he lived it. And so he again looked at the student and said, now let me ask you the question again. How long have you lived? The student looked back and said, doctor, when you say it that way, maybe an hour, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. Most of my life has been the meaningless passage of time between all too few moments when I was genuinely alive. What an interesting commentary. Most of us do not live life as we should. We just let it slip away from us. We wake up one day wondering where our life has gone. It seems to me that just as soon as my pimples cleared up, my hair fell out. <laughs> life slips by. It's gone. 
it's over. We need to ask ourselves whether we have truly lived life or just passed the time. Jesus said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Children are so intense, so spontaneous. They cry with agony. They laugh with joy. They're so turned on to what life is all about. So let's take a look this morning how we can be as turned on as children are in living joy-filled, faith-filled, hope-filled lives as individuals and as a church. Now, in good Lutheran tradition, we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? (laughs) What does it mean to become like little children? Well, probably not what you think it means, at least in this context. You see, children were not held up in the ancient world as having positive qualities for adults to emulate. Children were regarded as inferior in almost every way. I mean, they're physically weak, susceptible to illness, often rebellious and selfish, gullible, and, well, overly dependent upon others. No adult would want to be that way. Even today, we value those with physical strength, those who are independent, those who can think rationally and stand on their own two feet. And that's exactly why Jesus told his disciples, unless you change and become like a little child, weak, vulnerable, and dependent, you can't enter the kingdom. (laughs) You see, they had just had an argument over who was the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus wanted to teach them that the greatest and most important disciple, he's the one who's the weakest, the most humble and lowly, the most dependent on God, the most reliant on Jesus. Likewise, the most important church today is the one who is, in fact, in a condition of lowly powerlessness and who willingly acknowledges her own emptiness and utter inability to change lives on her own. In other words, we're to be just like little children, weak, vulnerable, and dependent. You know, children don't question their value. They don't worry about who's the greatest because they all know Well, they're all great. And so if you ask a two-year-old, how big are you? What do they say? So big. Or they flex their muscles (laughs) because they know they're great. They know they're important. Adults, on the other hand, are always worried about their worth and their value and their self-image. Most people I know are, well, they're down on themselves. Most people I know can name the things in their lives that are wrong. I bet you can too. And so we beat our chests and we say, there's so much wrong with me. Well, of course there's a lot wrong with you. (laughs) There's a lot wrong with me too. We're human. We're sinners. We're not perfect. We mess up all the time. But here's the good news of the gospel. Jesus himself came into the world not only to die for our sins, but to absorb everything that is dirty and ugly and negative and to free us from all of that. Jesus not only cleanses you from the dark side of your personality and removes those things that ought not to be, but he clothes you with his righteousness. That means that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin or all the things that you see that are wrong with you. No, he sees the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ, And through Jesus, God sees all that is right with you. He sees just how valuable you are, just like little children see themselves. And so you too can have the childlike freedom that comes with deliverance from all that is negative and dark. God's children never need to question their value. A dad took his son to Disneyland when he was just a little tyke, and as they were leaving, he said, I want another ride on Space Mountain. And the father said, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm out of money and I'm out of time. But the boy persisted like kids do, and he said, Jesus wants me to go. <laughs> the dad said, I'm, I'm, I'm not following. The boy said, well, you know, when, when you were in church, 
you said that whatever we feel, well, Jesus feels it too. When we cry, he cries. When we hurt, he hurts. You said Jesus feels every emotion we have. Well, that's right, the Father said. Well, if he feels every emotion I have, then when I'm laughing on Magic Mountain, he's having a good time too. I think Jesus would enjoy it if I had another ride on Space Mountain. (laughs) Not bad theology. You see, we have a God who wants us to be free from the burdens that keep us from enjoying life and living it intensely. He wants to fill us with an excitement, a childlike attitude that enables us to live life with incredible, spontaneous enthusiasm and joy. Do you have that in your life? (laughs) That's what Christianity is all about. That's what true spirituality is all about. It's not just about heaven. I mean, that's in the future. It's about a Jesus who invades your life and creates in you a spontaneous excitement about living now. It's about no longer worrying about the future and what might happen, but living in the moment and relying on Jesus to change your future for the good. That's why we, like little children, surrender each day to the Lord. God's children have a quality of spontaneous joy. You know, G.K. Chesterton once said, I think God's the only child left in the universe, and all the rest of us have grown old and cynical because of sin. (laughs) What a great line. Let me ask you another question. How did God create daisies? (laughs) <laughs> I say like a child. I mean, you throw a child up in the air or bounce him off your knee, and when you sit him on the floor, the first thing the kid says is, do it again. <laughs> throw him in the air and catch him. Bounce him off your knee. Set him on the floor, and again, he's going to yell, do it again. <laughs> do it 50 times. The 50th time, the kid is still yelling hysterically, do it again, do it again the excitement of a little child. That's how God created daisies. He created one daisy. I'm sure of it. And then in the childlike heart of God, he clapped and he said, do it again. (laughs) And he created daisy number two. And then something within God said, do it again. And he created daisy number three and four and five. And then 50 billion trillion daisies later, The great God of the universe is still creating with childlike excitement and joy and yelling, do it again. Remember when you were a kid so full of life, so vital and dynamic? (laughs) It's kind of grown dull and slow and boring, hasn't it? No wonder Jesus said, look, why don't you come to me and be born again? Why don't you become like a little child once again? Let me do my thing in you. Surrender to me. Allow me to run your life. I'm resurrected from the grave. I'll take possession of you, and I will change you, and I will give you a sense of worth so you'll be freed from the burdens of life. I'll fill you with my excitement so you'll know joy like you've never known it before. That's why the gospel is called good news. Well, there's a third childlike quality that comes to all of those who are fully alive in the Lord, and that's absolute confidence in the future. I've noticed that kids have great dreams about what they want to be when they grow up. Life hasn't beaten them down yet. They haven't yet experienced real hardships that suck the energy and dreams out of them. They still believe in the future. So ask a kid, what are you going to do? What are you going to be? And, well, they'll say, I'm, I'm going to be an astronaut, or I'm going to be a surgeon. They say, I'm going to be a musician, or I'm going to be a pro basketball player. They believe in the future. But then, as they grow older, ugly realism sets in. People begin telling them no all the time. Parents and adults begin telling them what they can and can't do and what they should and shouldn't become. 
Then it doesn't take long and a child's dream is shattered. Here is the good news of the gospel. We have a Jesus who creates dreams and visions for us. To paraphrase scripture, when the young no longer dream dreams and the old no longer have visions, the people perish. Children naturally believe that they can do something incredible with themselves. There are no limits. They can be anything. I say to you that the Jesus who imparts spontaneous joy and glorious visions of the future to children can impart it to you. So often people, especially older people, don't think they have much of a future. Well, I say a person is only old when his dreams of the past are more precious than his visions of the future. You're cynical when you don't believe in tomorrow. I want to tell you about the God who wants to make you believe in the future, even when you're old. I mean, Abraham was 94 years old when God gave him a vision. You're never too old, and you're never too young, to surrender to a God who will not only help you see how valuable you are, but also believe that the future will be better than the past. Let me close with this. One of the most inspirational persons of my life was my grandmother, a little old lady who was faithful to God and her church literally until her dying day. She always looked forward to tomorrow. After her oldest son died, well before his career took off as a distinguished professor at the University of Michigan, she focused on the blessings God gave to her remaining children and her grandchildren. And then when her husband died, she missed him and grieved terribly for him. But again, she focused on the future and the present and spent even more time with her grandchildren. Some of my fondest memories of my childhood are of playing dominoes with my grandmother and eating chocolate pudding that she had made fresh that day. And of course, of spending Saturday nights with her so that we could sleep a little later on Sunday morning since she lived right across the street from the Lutheran Church. It was a Saturday night, just like any other. She took her bath in the house in which she had lived for most of her widowed life, right across the street from the Lutheran Church, and she prepared herself for bed. She read her Bible, and she said her prayers, and then she laid out her Sunday dress, her pearl necklace, and her black Sunday shoes. They were placed symmetrically by the chair next to her bed, as they always were, all ready for use for Sunday worship in the morning. The last thing she did on this earth was to write out her check for the offering plate, which she placed in the envelope inside her purse right next to her Bible. It was a ritual that had been going on for decades. And that's exactly how my uncle found her on Sunday morning when she hadn't shown up at 8 o'clock worship. And that's how I will always remember my grandmother. She was awaiting tomorrow and the great things that the Lord would do. My friends, we are not done yet. Not as individuals and not as a church. God has made us fully alive for the past 151 years. We're his children. So let us continue to depend on him, to live lives of spontaneous joy and believe in a greater future yet to come here on earth and forever in heaven. Amen. We join our voices now with all who worship God, confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for 151 years as Emmanuel, celebrating God's love in this place, for all the lives the gospel has touched and changed for all eternity, and for all the lives still to be touched and transformed in the years to come, for we are not done yet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That God would preserve us from judgment with evil thoughts, especially from attempting to elevate our value by putting others down or by thinking negatively of ourselves and how we have missed the mark. Instead, may we value all people, including ourselves, as God's children and hold up all people with great esteem. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For parents, that they would raise up their children to know Christ as their help and hope, and not put their trust in princes in whom there is no salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the sick and those in any need, especially Carol Caruso, Kathy Duddleston, Kathy Harris, Del Jensen, Art Lutheris, George Meritz, Amy Morgan, Ruth Salick, Jeff Shakatano, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, grant them healing and peace according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the church. God has graciously blessed Emmanuel for over 151 years. He values us as his dear children. He invites us to live this life without fear or worry, 
joyfully following him wherever he leads. We know our future is strong and secure, and we can confidently go forward knowing that Jesus is our strength and foundation. We have been truly blessed. 151 years, there's so much to celebrate, but we're not done yet. So let me encourage you to give generously to the church so that we might continue to share Jesus with our community, that we may continue to be the city on a hill, a place where all can come to know their Savior, Jesus Christ. There are several ways you can give your offering to the church, and we're thankful for anything that you're able to give. Learn more by going to give.emmanuelcl.org. We're also grateful if you would fill out a connection card so that we might stay connected as the people of God. Just capture the QR code below or visit connect.emmanuelcl.org. There you can sign in and let us know that you were here. We are so glad that you are with us to worship today. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church. And we're not done yet. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.